From sound cartoons, technicolor, and feature-length animated films, to theme parks, world fairs, and cities of tomorrow, Walt Disney believed in the future. Walt found his inspiration from exploring unknown territory. In fact, to him, the future and the past were interchangeable. He found the same creative inspiration from the pioneers of the American West as he did from the modern scene of early space explorers. To Walt, they were one of the same. Daring men and women who braved new frontiers. His artists and lifelong collaborators shared similar beliefs. The Disney artists always contained a sense of freedom to explore new paths that supplied them with a sense of creative liberty. By the 1960s, the art of the theme park was just beginning to take flight in the same way that animated films were just 20 years prior. The past and the present met again to create new experiences for people craving inspiration in chaotic times. Although his untimely death would set back the progress of this artistic organization had sought out to achieve, one attraction would, over much time and even more turmoil, embrace the chaotic spirit of the age to create one of the most thrilling attractions to date. An attraction that salutes the human spirit of the unknown and lifts us out of the mundane practices of our daily lives and into the anxious next steps of human evolution, the infinite intrigue of outer space. Matterhorn Matt presents History Land. Walt Disney's fascination with the possibilities of space travel date back to the early rumblings of what would eventually become Disneyland. In fact, the Space Age was a key point of influence for the concept of early Tomorrowland. When Walt took to television to sell the many thematic realms that would make up his experimental theme park, Walt turned to different forms of entertainment. For Tomorrowland, he saw the capacity for entertainment in science-based documentaries. Directed and produced by Disney artist Ward Kimball, Walt would showcase documentaries that captured the drama, humor, intrigue, and science behind the future potential for space travel. It was the beginning of a career-long fascination. When Walt Disney began work on Disneyland, he enlisted different animators from his animation studio to work with him on this ambitious new project. One of these artists was John Hench, who began his time with Disney as a sketch and layout artist on films like Fantasia and Dumbo. Walt tasked Hench to design Disneyland's most difficult land, Tomorrowland. And so he did! With John Hench's artistic leadership, Disneyland opened with a space-themed adventure called Rocket to the Moon, which gave guests a thrilling sneak peek into a future in which commercial space travel would one day become a popular reality. That someday in the future, the average person would be able to explore the vast reaches of the universe, or at least our own immediate galaxy. With the eventual success of Disneyland after its first year of operation, Tomorrowland proved to be the land that would never be completed. There was always going to be new futures to explore and unknown ideas to curate. Already, Walt was excited by the future artistic opportunities his new project possessed. Not only did 1959 bring new attractions to Tomorrowland like the submarine voyage and the monorail, but it also produced a new breed of roller coaster with the Matterhorn. With a system designed by Bob Gurr, it revolutionized roller coasters, not just in technical design, but in theming. It was an artistic marvel. The area next to Rocket to the Moon will be filled with the notorious Flying Saucers, 
which proved to have many operational shortcomings, to say the least. With Walt and his artists finally starting to discover the true artistic potential for the parks, Tomorrowland was planned to undergo a major overhaul to represent new ideas for the future. The 1964 World's Fair would help with this venture. After the Matterhorn was completed, Walt is known to have turned to his Imagineers and said, Why can't we have a Space Mountain ride? With these words and the many artistic lessons learned with the World's Fair, John Hench would work once again on the land that challenged him from the very beginning. But unlike the early Tomorrowland, how would he capture a lasting mystery and intrigue within an ever-changing land? How would the danger and thrill of space travel be captured in a theme park attraction? John Hench had the solution. He just didn't know it in 1964. Jettison Disneyland 1, Space Mountain Code 2, clear for takeoff. Instrumentation? Instrumentation, go. Propulsion? Go. Facility? Go. Electrical? Go. All personnel, clear the launch platform. Space Mountain. It could only happen at Disneyland. Experience it now. The New York World's Fair had come and gone, but what remained was a profound purpose and vision for Disneyland. While the discoveries made in New York were inspirational to Walt and his artists, all of which would inspire the vision for a newly realized Tomorrowland, None seemed to solve John Hench's problem of bringing a so-called Space Mountain to life in a land that focused on making the future a tangible reality. Not only was outer space still an intangible mystery to the American public, though many advances have been made in space exploration, the technology required to make an indoor space-themed roller coaster was almost non-existent. The initial technological concept for the attraction expanded the Matterhorn's format by having a single car coaster run on four separate tracks in a futuristic, mountainous structure. At this time, the attraction was to be called Space Voyage. This was where most of the technological trouble lied. But primarily, Walt Disney had his attraction swept away by the creation of the Pirates of the Caribbean for the newly minted New Orleans Square. But Hench kept working on the project, designing concepts for the future attraction that would be a major part of the planned New Tomorrowland. But Walt suddenly died in late 1966, and with him went the vision and advocacy for new and daring attractions and projects. The new space thrill ride would have to be put on hold, and the New Tomorrowland of 1967 would open without Walt's Space Mountain. New Tomorrowland was a success and instantly became one of the most popular lands in the park. But now WED would be occupied by bringing Walt's dying vision to fruition, Walt Disney World. While the Magic Kingdom's Tomorrowland would serve the same philosophical function as its Disneyland counterpart, WED was partnering up with different companies to sponsor brand new attractions. Just like when Disneyland opened in 1955, Tomorrowland would prove to be the hardest land to plan and design. Wed decided to open Tomorrowland attractions in a series of different phases, and so Walt Disney World opened with a very unfinished Tomorrowland. For the next phases, Wed would seek out bigger and better projects. Marty Sklar and John Hench approached RCA to sponsor an attraction for Tomorrowland. Because RCA was an electronics company, Sklar and Hench began work on designing a computer-themed attraction, but when they finally met with the company head to pitch the idea, it was an absolute failure. So they went back to the drawing board. This time they noticed an overwhelming lack of thrill rides in the park because there was no room to build a Florida version of the Matterhorn. It then became clear that this might be the perfect opportunity to bring Walt's Space Mountain to life. And so they did. 
George McGuinness would help design the attraction along with former pilot Bill Watkins. Together, they would design the ride system that would perfect what the Matterhorn attempted less than 20 years earlier. And so, after many, many years, Space Mountain would finally begin construction in 1972. Space Mountain opened at Walt Disney World on January 15, 1975, with a huge ceremony and would forever change the definition of thrill ride. Just six months later, work began immediately on bringing a version of this attraction to where it was originally intended, Disneyland. Because of space issues, the ride would have to go from having two tracks to just one. But with the technological advances made with the Florida version, the team of artists and engineers would be able to consolidate and perfect the tubular steel roller coaster and even increase capacity. Disneyland Space Mountain opened on May 27, 1977 on the site of the former Flying Saucers. It was a phenomenon with a line stretching all the way to the park's main entrance. But could it last? What would happen when the excitement over the space age disappeared from the American people? Could a space-themed thrill ride survive a then-relevant cultural trend? Or would it have to go the way of many of its Tomorrowland predecessors? Not only would the public deem it a staple of the theme park experience, the future generations of artists would find themselves itching to breathe new life into this journey into the unknown. Go ahead. All video recorders off. Roger. SBO, turn off your video recorders and focus OSB camera to monitor spacecraft umbilical. Roger. OSB, do you read? Roger. Space Mountain, the greatest adventure in the universe, only at Disneyland Paris. With the success of Space Mountain in both parks, it became clear that it was an attraction that deserved a place in future Disney resorts. And so, in 1983, a new Space Mountain opened in Tokyo Disneyland, however it was only a basic replica of the Disneyland version. But in the late 1980s, when Michael Eisner gave Imagineers the creative freedom to design their own Disney theme park for France, these second-generation Disney artists jumped at the opportunity to expand and push forward the work their mentors pioneered. With Imagineers like Tony Baxter and Tim Delaney, classic attractions were redesigned to tell new stories. Attractions like Phantom Manor and Pirates of the Caribbean. When Tim Delaney began work on the Euro Disney version of Tomorrowland, he came up with the concept of having a Discovery Mountain. This was a large, Space Mountain-type structure that would house a majority of attractions in Discovery Land. This new theme for Tomorrowland would no longer focus on the premise of the future as seen through the eyes of the present, but rather it would focus on the creative visions that science fiction authors like Jules Verne and H.G. Wells contributed to our larger cultural landscape. Discovery Mountain would include various attractions themed around their works one of which would be a new Space Mountain ride that would be based on the Jules Verne From Earth to the Moon novel. 
but because Discovery Mountain's budget would be significantly high, work on the major piece of Discovery Land would be put on hold until the park proved to make a profit after its first year of operation. However, the park was a huge financial failure within the first year. As a result, Discovery Mountain was permanently shelved. After the park was able to find a temporary financial solution to remain open, Tim Delaney began working on an extremely scaled-down version of his ambitious project. Aside from a Nautilus walkthrough in an outdoor lagoon, Space Mountain would be the only attraction to be located in the mountain structure. Now, guests will be blasted off from a cannon to travel through space and the moon's lunar surface. Unlike other Space Mountain attractions, this one would include a launch and multiple inversions, making this the most thrilling of the three existing rides. Space Mountain, from the Earth to the Moon, would open the summer of 1995 and would save the park from financial ruin. The 90s would also see changes to Disneyland Space Mountain, with the addition of in-car music as well as new, and controversial, paint job during the new 1998 New Tomorrowland overhaul. The ride would close for two years in 2003, and luckily the exterior would be restored and new music tracks added by 2005. Hong Kong Disneyland would also receive their very own Space Mountain in 2005 as well. The 2000s also saw a new trend of adding seasonal overlays to Disney's Space Mountain with Rockin' Space Mountain, Space Mountain Ghost Galaxy, and more recently, Hyperspace Mountain. The Star Wars overlay that would also recently be permanently added to the Paris Space Mountain after its long run with Space Mountain Mission 2, which was added in 2005. So it's clear that of late, Space Mountain has been an attraction that Disney keeps adding layers and layers to. Whether or not these layers are thematically exciting, consistent, or relevant is only part of the point. Space Mountain as its own experience is what has drawn guests to its ominous structure for decades. It's truly an experience unlike any other, filled with excitement and intrigue. It allows us to trust the unknown and embrace the thrilling mystery of tomorrow. John Hench once recalled, I wanted to observe the first guests to take the trip. They were middle-aged and laughing among themselves as they sat in their vehicle waiting to go. As they took off, I walked over to the exit where the ride ends to wait for them. As their vehicle came to a stop, there was a dead silence. Some seemed to be hyperventilating. One woman stirred first and got out of the car. She knelt down and loudly kissed the carpet. The others got out of the car and started up the exit ramp. I followed them about halfway up the ramp. They broke into spontaneous, weak-in-the-knees laughter, patting each other on the back. It came to me that these people had not felt so alive in years as they did at that moment. These guests felt alive because of the effect of story forms we had designed for sensation and thrill. This is a demonstration of what playtime does for our guests. I haven't figured out yet how Walt understood so much about playtime. I do know that he always felt very much alive himself, and guided us in creating forms that inspire play. He helped us to understand that to create a play space, we Imagineers must trust our own feelings and instincts, and must always nurture our own sense of play.